Okay, we're still talking about advanced internal ballistics. We were discussing bore axis shifts that we're going to experience due to harmonic and vibratory inconsistencies. We're still on that. Within that subcategory, we're talking about bore and projectile dynamics and how, uh, how the relationships between the bore and the projectile can affect not only your point of impact due to shifts in the bore because of the different vibration patterns that will happen, uh, but also that can affect your muzzle velocity as well. So this video, we're going to discuss another thing that's very important for uh, long-range precision shooters, and that's cleaning. Uh, we just finished up a couple videos on coppering and propellant residue. And uh, those are going to be very important. Uh, if you haven't seen those yet, you might want to watch those before you uh, watch this video, or you might be a little confused where we're coming from. Also, you do want to be very familiar with uh, bore condition and bore wear. We uh, spend a lot of time talking about different erosion mechanisms, chemical, thermal, and uh, mechanical erosion that happens inside your rifle bore. And as we go on, we're going to be referring back to that from time to time. So if you miss those, you definitely want to check them out. Now, before we uh, start here, it's very important that I probably define exactly what we're trying to accomplish in this particular video, uh, because there's a lot of different shooting disciplines out there. And uh, the cleaning regime for those different shooting disciplines is going to be very dependent on the shot cycle that those guys use, right? And the way we're going to clean an M240 machine gun is going to be drastically different than the way we're going to clean a long-range precision rifle with the purpose of uh, trying to make first-round hits. That's key, first-round hits at extended unknown ranges. In order to accomplish that particular goal, we're going to have to know before we pull the trigger the okay. exact bore conditions. We're going to have to have those very, very consistent every time we go out because we're going to have these... Uh, complicated firing solutions we're going to calculate that we're going to have to be able to predict the exact muzzle velocity our projectile is going to leave the barrel. Otherwise, uh, you could be off dramatically at long range. So with that criteria in mind, uh, that's what we're going to use to base our long range precision rifle cleaning regime off of, okay? So if, you're, uh, if you have a deer rifle, for example, and you go out and you're shooting deer at, um, you know, medium ranges, like out to maybe 400 yards or something like that, you're, you're probably not going to need to use this particular uh, gun cleaning regime. Uh, like I said, if you're using an AR-15 or something for three-gun competition, you definitely are going to have a different cleaning regime. So I just want to stress that point so that we're oh, all on it. the same page here before we get started. Okay, so I'm going to go over these four main points, and then we're going to talk about different cleaning equipment and how they relate to those points. And then I'm gonna actually go through and we're gonna discuss bore break-in. And then finally, we'll get into the long range precision rifle cleaning regime and uh, how, to, how to take care of your bore in, a, in one of these rifle systems in a way that's not gonna throw you off every time you go out in the field. Okay, so let's get to it here. Uh, now there's a lot of different ways that you could uh, effectively clean and maintain your rifle bore for the purposes we're talking about. So it's gonna be very, very hard for me to cover them all. So what I'm gonna do with this uh, main points part of the video here that we're just about to go over is communicate what exactly we are trying to accomplish in our rifle bores for this purpose, for our shooting discipline of extreme long range shooting at unknown distances, okay? So I'll just go ahead and read all four and then we'll go back and look at them in greater detail individually. First thing we're going to try to accomplish is we want to keep the bore as consistent as possible from shot to shot. We don't want to change it any more than is needed. Um, the second thing is we want the bore to be in a state of coppering and uh, powder fouling equilibrium. I don't know if you remember like what we talked about earlier. We, we want that equilibrium. Uh, the third thing is we want to minimize bore erosion so that we can increase our barrel service life. And uh, the fourth thing is we want to avoid damage to the bore, obviously. Okay, so let's look at this in greater detail here. What do we mean by we want to keep our bore as consistent as possible? Um, like we talked about earlier, it doesn't take very big of a difference inside the bore to totally change that pressure curve and that can consequently have all kinds of stuff that goes on 
uh, you, you know, it's going to change your point of impact from the vibration differences, and it could change your muzzle velocity. Uh, so differences in the bore from you know shot cycle to shot cycle. I'm talking you go out one week and you go out the next week. Uh, if you change your internal bore conditions, the dimensions particularly, how much friction you got between the bullet and the bore, the more you're changing that, the worse off you're going to be because it's going to be really hard to get a bearing on exactly what kind of trends you're building up. There's already enough variables going on uh, with this long-range shooting that, I mean, there's going to be multiple things playing off each other, and you want to keep the rifle system as constant as you can, like a laboratory. You want to keep these things. You want the rifle bore to be a constant, if it's possible. Now, unfortunately, you know, on a microscopic level, from shot to shot, you're going to have erosion pretty much no matter what you do. So it's going to be real hard to uh, keep it a constant, but... You're going to want to keep it as consistent as possible. So you're not going to want to change things up in there if it's not necessary. Now, um, we did talk earlier about uh, the modern powder recipes and the propellants and uh, in the chemical bore erosion video, and that's very important to understand. Now, uh, this cleaning regime we're going to be talking about here that I'm going to recommend you guys kind of adopt is not going to apply to uh, really old uh, propellant recipes like for example or, or particularly the primer chemistry if you have really old ammunition if you're shooting antique military rifles and you've got like world war ii surplus ammo this cleaning regime is not going to work you're going to just have to go through and uh, be very very aggressive with your cleaning and make sure you get all that stuff out of the board every time you park the rifle on the shelf otherwise you know the mercury fulminus particularly and some of the other uh gunpowder recipes were pretty nasty back in the old days so if you're shooting ammunition that's like way older than you are you probably want to make sure that you clean it every time if we, th this video will be talking about modern ammunition stuff that is being manufactured currently particularly in the last 25 years so like we talked about in the last uh couple videos all, most of these cleaning regimes that you're going to hear about were established at a time when the the residues that are left inside your bore from the powder and particularly the primers were very corrosive but uh with modern stuff it's not going to be a problem for the most part so we're going to want to keep it as consistent as possible now you're going to have to keep in mind all the different erosion mechanisms we talked about particularly mechanical erosion now if you remember from the earlier videos we have the chemically affected zone if we're looking at a microstructure of the inside of a rifle bore that surface the very outside of that surface is going to be a very brittle zone called the chemically affected zone, also known as the white layer. And if you remember from the video there, uh, that's basically what happens chemistry-wise. You get all these different uh, elements basically jammed into the structure of the, the steel, and that makes for kind of a brittle steel. And what happens is it cracks over time, it starts flaking, and that weakens it. On top of the uh, chemical erosion, you have the thermal you know, there's like a thermal shock that happens every time you shoot. You have instant, uh, you know, 3,700 degrees Kelvin of uh, hot gas going through your entire bore. And that can heat up the surface of that steel really hot above the austenite phase, which embrittles it. Okay. So that on the very, very surface layer of your bore, you have an embrittled zone of steel. A lot of it's not the steel that it started off originally being. It's changed its composition and... The thermal shocking has made it even more brittle, okay? So that's something you need to be aware of. That's why mechanical erosion does happen so rapidly in a, in a rifle bore. If you think about it, you only have a couple seconds of service life. If you figure out how much time a bullet actually is flying through the barrel, it translates to a few thousand rounds, but the amount of time is actually only a couple seconds worth of friction going on in there. So it's not really... a it's it's a real real harsh conditions inside there is what i'm trying to say so that you need to be aware of that and uh the mechanical erosion that you have is talking about that even though it's a copper jacketed bullet you got to think about it steel is a lot more you know strong than copper so you would think that copper would rub off on steel more than steel would rub off uh, rub off on copper and that's true but you still have that's why bore erosion happens is because that embrittled zone of the steel is being rubbed off even by copper so you got to keep that in mind that even a copper brush right you're using a copper or even a nylon bristled brush uh you have uh that white layer and the 
in the chemically affected affected zone in particular that's very very brittle it's not strong like steel the original steel structure was so even a copper brush is going to remove that mechanically so every time you uh pass a, a copper brush through the bore you're accelerating the mechanical erosion mechanism even more so in a lot of ways than you would be with with a rifle bullet and also a rifle bullet is uh, very consistent in how they pass through the bore from shot to shot. I mean, you got the rifling, kind of stabilizes it, and it's going to be um, a lot more consistent than your arm is going to be ramming a rod down the barrel. So, and you have the bristles. It's, uh, the, you know, each individual bristle is going to dig into the microstructure of a bore in a different way than a smooth copper jacket would. So there's a kind of a big difference between a copper brush and a bullet. Now, a bullet is very tight on certain regions, especially where it's engraved into the rifling. So you have a lot more friction there, that's for sure. I'm just saying the level of consistency is a, a, a lot different between a bullet and a, a rifle brush. Even So even a copper brush does remove material from the bore, material that used to be uh, good steel, but has been embrittled by these erosion, uh, you know, particularly thermal and chemical processes. So if our goal is to keep our bore conditions as consistent as possible for our particular purposes, um, this isn't going to matter significantly in other weapon systems. You got a 50 caliber machine gun or something. You can go ahead and clean that out, and it's not going to you're not going to notice because obviously you're not holding it to the same precision standards that we are. But in a precision rifle at extreme range, we're talking over a thousand meters on small targets, particularly you will notice a significant point of impact change uh, every time that you clean your bore. And you can even see this at 100 meters sometimes on paper if you're measuring it, but, but particularly at long range because then you have a muzzle velocity variation mixed in there as well, which can tremendously affect your vertical dispersion depending on if it, you know, it usually slows the bullet down a little bit actually. And uh, the reason for that is when you reduce the uh, friction when you increase the, the the bore diameter by removing material from the bore there's less gas pressure it doesn't seal that bullet as well and so your uh, your pressure actually goes down a little bit and that's what translates to the lower velocity so it's a little counterintuitive it works kind of the opposite uh, than what a lot of people think so we want to keep the bore as consistent as possible that's very very important every time you you clean it you're going to change the frictional dynamics between the bore and the projectile enough to cause a point of impact shift. So we're going to have to figure out how we're going to, because you do need to clean your bore. I mean, there's going to be times you're going to have to clean it. Um, so we're going to have to figure out how to get that to where we can predict where it's going to change the point of impact or how to get the bore back up to those uh, same conditions that it was before we cleaned it as close as possible. All right, so the second main point that we talked about is we want the bore to be in a state of coppering and powder fouling equilibrium, if possible. And that's related to what we were just talking about with consistency. Uh, what happens is when you're shooting, like we discussed on the earlier videos, you're going to have copper depositing in the rifle bore, and you're also going to have a, a certain amount of powder fouling deposit in there as well. And that's going to change your frictional dynamics. Now, if you plot this out, and it depends on what kind of rifling you have, this varies tremendously from bore to bore. But basically, you start off with a completely fresh bore, perfectly clean, all you got steel. You fire your first round, you're going to deposit some copper and some powder falling. You fire a few more rounds, you're going to deposit some more copper and some more powder falling. After a certain point, you've deposited uh, a certain amount, but then the next round behind it removes the same amount that it is depositing before, and you reach, reach that state of equilibrium as far as copper and uh, powder falling is concerned. Now, it's never really a truly a state of equilibrium. It does slowly tend to climb, and this varies also tremendously uh, You know, from cartridge to cartridge. You have a hotter cartridge. You're going to have uh, less equilibrium. It's going to deposit more uh, copper more rapidly. Um, you know, than a, a mild round would. So if you got a real super high velocity round or uh, a cartridge is loaded very, very hot, you're going to have a uh, more rapid deposition of copper, obviously. But there is still a, a, a place on that curve that you can look as your uh, dimensions and your coppering increase where it kind of starts to level off and then it stabilizes for a long time. That's 
the place we want to be because that's a place where we can sort of predict. We can develop all our different ballistics tables for those bore conditions. And then um, basically they'll be good for a long time. And once you clean the rifle, you're going to have to reestablish those internal bore conditions again. And the way that most guys do that, if when you do clean a rifle, uh, you do have to have some fouling shots and you're going to have to shoot a few rounds to get it back up past that initial part where it's climbing up, where it's not at a state of equilibrium until you get to that flat spot there in the graph. And then it'll be relatively stable again for quite a while. And it depends, uh, you know, like I said, on cartridge and uh, exactly how smooth your bore is on how long it takes to get to that point. So that's something we're going to concern ourselves with as well when we're talking about our uh, bore cleaning regime for this particular shooting discipline. So that equilibrium point is the goal. That's where we want to be. The third thing we talked about is we want to minimize bore erosion in order to increase barrel service life. And this is kind of a point of a lot of debate. A lot of guys get kind of fired up about this, and I see a lot of arguments on the, what do you call them things, uh, blogs or whatever, or where they're you know, talking, typing to each other, you know. But if you look at all the uh, old advertisements for a lot of the different powder uh, solvent cleaning companies or the copper solvent cleaning companies on the bottles, you'll read it. They'll say, this will uh, clean your barrel, keeping it nice and clean or whatever, and increasing your service life. Well, sounds like a pretty good deal, right? So a guy should use that product more often and make sure that your bore is constantly nice and clean. Then you'll increase your service life. Well, it's not really that simple. It is true that if you uh, allow your bore to get extremely filthy, particularly in real uh, humid environments or if you, uh, in a corrosive environment, a lot of guys live on the coast where you have salt water kind of in the air, that can cause problems particularly if you're using the 4140 chrome molly steel, like the standard blue type rifle barrels. Stainless steel is going to be a little more resistant to corrosion, obviously. Um, so it's less of a problem with those. But it is true that if you have a lot of carbon in particular, you know, from the propellants and stuff built up in there, that can attract water. And uh, there's other corrosive elements like we talked about in our chemical bore erosion video that can really uh, accelerate corrosion. And corrosion is a bad thing. That really embrittles your steel. And that doesn't help at all. But uh, you got to keep in mind, like we just said before, that most of these uh, corrosive properties of these propellants in particular are misunderstood because the modern recipes have changed tremendously. Uh, I didn't talk about it in a lot of detail, but most of these gunpowder recipes, like the new gunpowder recipes, uh, have a lot of nitrogen produced when they're burned. And nitrogen actually acts to preserve the steel in the bore quite well. So it's, it's sometimes the powder falling is actually more protective than it is corrosive. Another thing to consider, uh, particularly with coppering, is that although coppering can, uh, you know, it technically does assist in mechanical bore erosion due to the fact of the differential expansion of the copper when the thermal expansion takes place from shot to shot. That can widen those cracks and those little pits a little more. Um, but you really got to balance this out. You got to really look at the microstructure and determine which of these erosion mechanisms is going to have the most negative effects on a rifle bore. Is uh, the copper deposition in our bore going to cause more problems than a uh, brush would when you're uh, ramming a brush down the bore to clean it? Or is the uh, powder falling residue going to cause more of a problem chemically than the bare exposed steel would uh, because it's being embrittled by thermal processes? Or is that chemically aff affected zone actually acting to insulate the steel in, in the bore from further erosion? These are all things we need to consider um, when we're discussing minimizing bore erosion. And another huge uh, factor that's not really discussed as much when we're talking about minimizing bore erosion has to do with your shot cycles. How, how many rounds are you going to fire at a time in one sitting? Now, for our purposes, long-range precision shooting, you're going to take one shot, possibly two, and then you're going to relocate or you're going to be done for the day. You're going to get whatever it was you're trying to get, right? So we're not talking about a battle rifle like an M16, an M4, an M60 machine gun, something like that. We're not talking about that kind of uh, heat erosion. I suppose if you're shooting varmints, you might take a lot more shots from one sitting, 
But there again, you're probably going to be using a bolt action, or even if you're using a semi-auto, you're going to be making well, uh, you know, aimed shots, and you're going to have more time in between those shots to cool. So a lot of this uh, barrel life, a lot of guys ask questions about what's the service life of a barrel. That depends tremendously on how how rapidly you fire. You know, for how, how much time do you have in between shots? That can have a huge effect on barrel life. Uh, another thing that has a huge effect on barrel life is how hot your cartridge is loaded. We'll talk about that more in reloading. But if you got real hot loads or a real high velocity cartridge, uh, your barrel life might be significantly reduced. If you got a lot of overborn, like a 264, um, you know, Magnum, those things are kind of infamous for having kind of short uh, barrel lives because they have a tremendous amount of throat erosion. Just a lot of gunpowder burning through that little hole. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of hard to give a, a to quantify an answer for service life. And uh, I'll tell you though that from my own experience at 243 Winchester, I've put a lot of rounds through my Ruger M77 in the last 12 years, and uh, it's still going strong. I've went above and beyond the maximum life expectancy of that bore. And uh, what I've done is I've actually minimized my bore cleaning and only cleaned at times when it was necessary to clean the bore. And we'll show you in a minute how to determine when those times are. But if your goal is to minimize bore erosion, we don't want to be introducing that mechanical erosion mechanism, which is our brush, uh, to the bore unless we have to. Now, bore erosion due to cleaning, it's important for me to stress this too, uh, bore erosion due to cleaning can be minimized if you're doing everything correctly and if you're not using any uh, real aggressive or abrasive type solvents. And that's uh, we'll talk more about that in just a minute when we start talking about cleaning equipment. So if you're cleaning your bore correctly, you're going to minimize these problems. And that leads us to our fourth main point, which is we want to avoid damage to our bore. That can cause tremendous problems. That's probably the primary cause to premature uh, you know, bore failure in your service life. If your bore wears out in 1,000 rounds or even 2,000 rounds, it's probably because you're wearing it out through improper cleaning techniques. Um, so we're going to discuss different uh, cleaning equipment and how to properly use it. Uh, when we do go through our actual long-range precision cleaning regime here, we're going to primarily concentrate on things that you don't want to do because your bore. You can do 100 passes through your bore with a brush, and uh, it'll cause less erosion and damage than it would one time doing it improperly. So that's something that we're going to really go through. Um, a, a lot of times guys make blanket statements when this uh, topic comes up, and they talk about how cleaning a rifle bore can wear it out much more quickly. And what's really going on, what they really mean, mean by that is that you can you can wear out your white rifle bore much more quickly if you're cleaning improperly. If you're doing everything correctly and you're not using like abrasive solvents, uh, you're not going to really have these uh, problems. You still are going to introduce that mechanical erosion, but it's not going to be near to the same degree that it would have been if you were doing it incorrectly. And uh, we'll discuss that in a minute. So when we're talking about minimizing bore erosion or avoiding bore damage, it's really over cleaning or improper cleaning techniques that are amplifying the mechanical erosion of the bore. If you're doing it properly, you could clean your rifle bore every time and you really won't have any problems. Um, but the, the, the situation really arises, the more often you do clean your rifle bore, the greater the possibility is you could screw up and you could ding your uh, crown or you could have something misaligned and you could rub on the sides and cause damage uh, that way. Now, we are going to clean our bores, but we want to make sure that we do it very, very carefully. That's kind of the heart of your rifle system there. If you screw that up, the whole thing's pretty much going to fail. It's not going to work very well. So we need to consider some of the most vulnerable areas inside a rifle bore. If we want to establish a wise bore cleaning regime here, and, uh, you know, make uh, wise decisions on how to use our equipment. So there's uh, three areas we're going to talk about. The first one is the crown of the muzzle. And then we're going to talk about the throat region. And then we're going to talk about just the rifling in between those two areas, okay? The crown of the muzzle is the very end of the muzzle. The crown is going to be the last thing that your bullet rubs on on its way out the bore. 
So if you have any little tiny dings or inconsistencies or anything change at all at the crown region, you're going to have a total different signature of gas flow uh, as that bullet is exiting. For example, if you get one of those little corners on the rifling or one of them edges that's just even slightly damaged, even a tiny amount, uh, or something that gets snagged or something on the way out, it's going to really torque that bullet goofy on its way out the, the muzzle. And uh, you could have a gas jet that's, uh, you know, on one side of the crown that's a lot heavier than it was before. And that could disproportionately kind of give it that last push on the, on the way out. And that could introduce a lot of problems that we'll discuss in external ballistics video. So uh, a very, very sensitive area. That's probably the, the part of the bore that you want to be the most careful with because it's the easiest part to damage. It's, uh, you know, it's right at the tip of your barrel. It's, it's close to the outside especially if it's not protected by a muzzle brake or by a flash suppressor or something like that. Uh, you, it's easy to ding. Uh, if you're transporting your rifle, for example, in a vehicle, a lot of hunters uh, like to keep the muzzle kind of against the floor there. You got to be really careful. That's a bad idea for a number of reasons. Uh, you're going to have all kinds of sand and grit and rocks on the floor of a pickup truck, right? And if you got your muzzle rubbing up in there, uh, a rock is going to definitely scratch or bung up your crown pretty bad, and that, that's going to cause major problems. It doesn't take very much to completely destroy your accuracy potential of your rifle. Um, and this is an area of the bore that is very susceptible to damage due to improper cleaning as well. Um, a lot of different places train people to clean a rifle bore by inserting a rod down the muzzle you know, from the front end first. And uh, that's kind of a, there's there's some argument as to different methods of doing this. Now, it is possible to, you know, effectively clean the bore by going that route. It's just very dangerous because uh, if you have any kind of rubbing on your way in there, and you got to think about it, even a copper bristle brusher is going to usually have steel on the middle. If you even touch that crown on your way in, that's that could cause problems. So you got to be very, very careful when you're inserting it. And I'm going to recommend just cleaning from the breech to eliminate that whole problem. Uh, if there's any part you want to be careful with, it's the crown. And just in order to ensure that we minimize damage to that area, if we are cleaning with a, uh, a rod, we're going to want to do it from the back side. And we're going to also want to protect the throat region back there by using a bore guide. And that's going to keep that rod uh, centered in there as you're basically pushing it back and forth. And we'll discuss that in a lot more detail real quick here when we start talking about the cleaning equipment next. But uh, that's the main thing I want to get across right now is the crown of the muzzle. you got to be very, very careful about that. It depends on what kind of cleaning equipment you're using. If you're using a rod, there's certain things you want to be careful of. Uh, and we'll discuss those. And if you're using one of the pull-through types like a boar snake or one of those Otis-type setups, uh, you want to be very careful even with those uh, when, it when we're talking about the crown. Another area of the boar we want to talk about is that throat region. That's just immediately in front of the chamber. And uh, that's kind of where you have that transition from the chamber into the rifling. And uh, that's going to be the first spot, for example, if we're cleaning from the breech with a rod and you're not using a bore guide, you're going to be ramming that rod into the, the throat and it's going to rub on the sides there. And that's going to act, the throat is actually going to act to be your aligning tool. And even though your rod is not we're not going to use steel rods. That's going to be a bad idea. Even if you have a, a, a coated rod or, uh, you know, something like that, an aluminum rod or whatever you're going to be using, uh, we just talked about how there's embrittlement of the steel. So it doesn't matter that you're using a coated rod. You still have very, very brittle steel, particularly in the throat region. Now, the throat region is susceptible mainly not, uh, not only from its position, but primarily because that's the, re uh, the region with the most severe thermal erosion it's immediately adjacent to the chamber i mean it's right on there right so that's right next to where all the the initial part of the powder burn is so your temperatures and your pressures are extremely high in that region so you're going to have a lot of expansion of steel coupled with the embrittlement of steel due to the thermal processes primarily in that particular region and that's going to cause accelerated erosion and uh, you, we can look at this picture again we showed this before but this is basically representing uh, 
the areas in the bore on the graph on top and on the bottom is just showing where we're at on the bore, but the areas within the bore that have the most uh, erosion taking place. Uh, and you can see that on the graph there towards the, uh, the, the throat region, you have a huge amount. And as you get in towards the middle of the rifling, it's, uh, it's lower. There still is erosion. And then at the transition from the rifling into the air, at the crown region, you do have a little bit more erosion again. Uh, so that's just something to take a look at. So the throat region already has a lot of erosion going on. You don't need to help it along. Usually when a bore wears out, that's basically what did it in is uh, that throat erosion got too far and it eroded, it'll erode up to a half inch or more. Or, you know, it, at a certain point, the erosion has removed enough material to where when the bullet exits the, the case and tries to enter the rifling, there's so much room. And uh, depending on how it's eroded, that thing can get real crooked during the engraving process into the bore there. And that'll cause some pretty good problems. And uh, we'll discuss that in more detail when we talk about external ballistics again. Um, so the throat erosion is, uh, is definitely already an issue. You don't need to help it along by improper cleaning techniques. So we'll discuss that, those, those techniques when we talk about the, the different equipment. And the rifling, the regular rifling is relatively safe from um, improper cleaning because once the brush uh, is in the center of the rifling, it's relatively aligned. And unless you're really doing something goofy in there or using some kind of abrasives, uh, you're probably not going to risk a whole lot of damage to the the middle part of the rifling. It's that uh, crown region and the throat region that we're going to have to watch like a hawk.